All right. Well, uh, welcome everybody to my first virtual digital Hollywood uh, panel, um, and uh, but not the first virtual digital panel that I've had to do. Um, as somebody said out there, there are dozens of us out there. Um, this one, uh, making movies, uh, I, or we can even brought it into making content uh, using the cloud. Uh, I love when we can put all these words together, um, all all the words, um, but literally diving into virtual production uh, and what the heck that is. Um, <laughs> I have a August body that is spanning two continents uh, joining us today um, and multiple time zones. Um, and what I thought I would do is, uh, I'll give a brief introduction of myself, uh, and then we will go down the line. Uh, my name is John Canning. I'm the EP over at Digital Domain, as I like to say, responsible for neither film nor television nor commercials. <coughs> so, uh, I'm responsible for all of the other areas that we apply the mad visual effects techniques to. Um, and uh, as things have certainly pivoted, but being involved in what they would call virtual production in all aspects of it, um, I think today we'll get into saying everybody's definition of virtual production is probably slightly different. And we all come to it from, you know, different areas. Uh, well, maybe Boo and I come from the same exact area. Um, but yeah. uh, but it's, uh, it's looking at new production techniques, I would say, from the moment of concepting and previs all the way to final pixel. And we look at different areas that we're tackling of that uh, and, and the tools and techniques that we use along to that. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Boo. Why don't you take it away and tell us who you are and just give a quick little intro on your virtual production thoughts. Okay, just really quick, right? So yeah, yeah. I'm Boo Wong. I'm uh, the uh, group director of emerging technology for the mill. And just like real quick history, Mill's been around for 30 years, you know, started in film production from the Gladiator. So at that time, the high tech stuff was ooh, um, digital crowds and stadiums. <laughs> um, and then all the way through to making more commercial content. And, you know, in the last five or six years, I've basically led the transformation for the Mill and using emergent technology to, um, to create uh, new types of content and also as platforms for new types of content. So in very discrete terms, the space that I've been working in with my team is XR, it's interactive, it's physical and um, also virtual um, spaces and experiences. Um, so for that, like we've used a lot of, you know, obviously a lot of interactive um, technologies uh, as well as a lot of game engine platforms. And so for us, you know, like going from not just looking at um, the end game of it being XR and, and interactive, uh, we're also looking at these tools now to how they can actually work with the core uh, historical, if you would put it, part of the business, you know, and how that feeds into virtual production so that it's not just we're making, um, you know, whatever, uh, 300 uh, social AR filters, we're actually using AR on set. So, you know, to John's point, virtual production, I'm sure you're going to say, who's defining what that is? Like, it, does that include all the visualization on set? Does that include using uh, a game engine to render passes instead of Arnold? Does it include virtual sets? Like what is the umbrella? So I'm sure that there will be questions about that coming up, but that's kind of my uh, 10,000 foot view. Fantastic, thank you, Boo. Um, Brett, how about you next? I realized I'm now going in alphabetical order, but there we go. <laughs> so hi, I'm uh, Brett Leonard. I, uh, you know, been associated with the term virtual for almost 30 years uh, because I directed and wrote the film, The Lawnmower Man, which at that time I had to force the uh, the company to put the term virtual reality into the trailer because no one knew what that meant. Um, so the film in many ways popularized the concept and idea for people outside of the Cognizenti. And, um, and so I've been very, very interested in, uh, you know, virtual reality as an overall, uh, metric and overall medium for many 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 years and inter how do you how do you actually you know pivot cinematic storytelling and cinematic uh, language into an immersive language and how do you know what's that undiscovered country between uh gameplay and uh, agency and, and linear narrative all these things are fascinating to me and i've done a number of projects in that area one of which is a full feature film that i shot in in both traditional cinema and 360 VR video. 
uh, which is, you know, which is a crazy project called Hollywood Rooftop. And we're going to be putting that all together within the gaming engine uh, environment and doing something I call the emotion glass, which is to be able to dive deeper into cinematic language and storytelling, but within the context of having agency within the context of the environment, amazing scent of the story. So things like that. In terms of virtual production, I've had to use what I would call a virtual studio concept for almost every project I've ever done. Uh, going, you know, going back to the lawnmower man. I mean, I, I didn't have the budgets to do things uh, by going to larger shops, like wonderful places like the mill at that time didn't exist, but you know, it, it, it uh, so I've always had to sort of, you know, kludge things together in a unique way and, and have learned and built the muscle of, utilizing virtual, you know, at a distance collaboration techniques and uh, all kinds of things like that. At the current moment, I'm the co-founder of a company called Studio Lightship with my co-founder, uh, Josh Shore. And we are uh, doing what we call a world building process. For me, virtual production, all these things go under the, the concept of world building. Uh, and what does that mean in relation to how it fits into the traditional and custom bound aspects of traditional uh, feature film production and beyond. And that's, that's really, uh, I think something that we could obviously get into deeper, but that's, that's my area of passion and where I'm, you know, pushing it with some pretty interesting projects with some great significant IP right now. Well, that sounds like, we'll come back to that. All right. <laughs> Last but not least, all the way from a different time zone and a different continent. <laughs> so take it away. Hey, um, thanks for having me here, by the way. Um, I didn't mind staying up so late. Like I was talking about a minute ago, I've just had a couple of glasses of wine, so we'll be fine at this end. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm the founder and CEO of Rewind. We're an um, immersive uh, experience company based out of London and a small office in San Francisco. And we've been, been running for kind of nine years, creating all kinds of things for big brands, energy drinks, oil companies, a uh, little bit of everything. But most recently, putting virtual reality in the back of moving vehicles for NBC Universal, uh, Uber and Ford to kind of show you what could happen if you had uh, the ability to put people in any space whilst they're on their journey and kind of show what happens when we're all going to be passengers. Um, prior to that, I was a, a university professor at the University of Hertfordshire for 12 years, wrote um, four degrees and two masters in animation, visual effects and game design and taught 1300 students and they're everywhere. They're executives and directors at the mill, the people at DD. Like I'm very proud of my alumni being everywhere and one day I managed want to kind of call them all back to, to work with me one day. Um, along the journey, having created so much immersive content, I'm very proud to chair BAFTA's Immersive Entertainment Advisory Group to try and help the British Academy understand where immersive sits. And very much at the moment it sits within the virtual production space where people are using the tools to create traditional content. Where it fits as actual like entertainment medium is a kind of a slower burn as we all know. I also chair another group for the British government called Immerse which is the use of the technology outside of entertainment and I write a little bit for Forbes on uh, the whole area. So I'm kind of excited to talk to you guys about it. Great. And for, yeah. virtual, and, and for virtual production specifically, um, I see, I see it as a core technology for everything we're going to be doing. Um, I was speaking to you yesterday about it, that I think there's an opportunity that as you know, our, our asset pipelines and our content pipelines, our delivery mediums are kind of converging together, we're going to get one kind of production, one side of project, and then we'll take kind of branches out and deliver into different ways of experiencing it. There will be the full immersion, there'll be the semi-active, there'll be the passive content. And it should really come from one set, one story, one set of characters, one world that we're creating. And whether you want to pre-visit or post-visit or deliver it, shouldn't really matter in the end. Well, all right, so that's, I think, a good launching off point because it seems that, again, as we've all talked about the, the virtual production bag is amorphous. Um, and everybody seems to be coming to it from a different perspective. Um, but what are some of the key tenets in your mind of where we are headed with some of these new production techniques? What is the, you know, in, in Boo, you can start us off with, but if you were going to have to say, if, what are some of the characterizations that you would say, all right, if somebody runs up to you in the middle of the night or in a virtual conference um, and says virtual production, what are some of the core tenants that you're starting to think about that are you know, different or, or really hallmarks of what we're starting to look at? 
Right. So I think that, you know, I think of it in, in two kind of, and as I talk, I'm probably going to add more categories, but in two general buckets, right? There's a utility bucket, and then there's the for creative purposes or uh, consumption purpose. So utility for virtual production, it's like you can't go somewhere to do a shoot. So you want to do a virtual set uh, 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 production, or you are going to get AR on set. Or in, you know, in some cases, you know, you want to have more of a, you know, your deliverable needs to be slightly more interactive or more virtual, you know, or it's a virtual character that you can interact with, or it's truly programmatic content, like the way Bandersnatch was starting to get. So I think that, um, and obviously that was not virtual production, but that was in a sense interactive. So I think that, you know, if, if the way I kind of bucket it out is those two areas. I think right now, a lot of the focus is on the utility part as it tends to be, because a lot of the advancements in that come from problem solving, right? Like, what are the problems we have? Oh, well, let's let's see what's available, what's used. And this not just from us, the people who make content, but also from the technology companies. I mean, consider the announcements that, you know, Epic put out yesterday with UE5, good God, you know? Or like, I think, you know, the, the same, I think the same day Unity came out with their virtual character, you know, toolkit. You know, and so like the technology platforms are all also paying attention and they're all problem solving. So to a certain extent, it's starting from the utility point of view. And right. from there, it's when that gets into the hands of us, you know, and we get past the first problem, like how do we do this shoot? How do we get these virtual characters in? How do we get it in previs so that we move faster so that we can iterate together, collaborate in a, in a, in a game scene across multiple uh, in these distributed teams that we are right now. And I know I'm saying a lot of different things <laughs> and kind of going through a lot of parts, but I guess the kind of the summary of it for me is that it starts with your utility. And then once it gets into the hands of the creative people, um, then, then you're gonna see how it branches off into other things. How are we going to use these tools for other ends and to other ends and means? Right, right. And I, it, you know, I think I've said this kind of, more than once that what to me is interesting is when you think about using some of these tools, AR and VR as purpose-driven technologies. Right. Uh, you know, there's a period of time and Saul and, and you and, and we've all talked about this where um, there was virtual reality was sort of the hammer for everybody's nail. Um, yeah. And we yeah. quickly realized that it, in some cases, just you, you didn't need it. But in some cases, I think we're finding this and certainly in a production standpoint, we're finding this is where we're using it as a tool and it's helping us do our job better or easier or accomplishing things we haven't been able to do before. Um, so using them in that sense. Um, and particularly well, these days, right? You know, just real quick, it's just like, you know, we, we've got productions on where, well, first of all, there's a lot of client interest. You mentioned VR right now because it's a platform that is, you know, safe, but also as a production tool. We've, we've virtualized some of our productions because we need to, to be able to see what the other next guy is seeing and not just as a screen share. We have to actually see yeah. him in the space. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I touched base with a friend of mine um, who's the CEO of Magnopus. They did all the kind of virtual production tools for Lion King and maybe doing some other bits and pieces. And they're saying they're working right now with a whole bunch of directors and cinematographers creating their entire movies from home. They ship them some hardware, give them a headset, and they're on set wherever the set may be and the engineers are working from their house and they're they're knocking out the film as quickly as they can even though the people aren't ever together and so when they come out of it you know the pre the film is already uh, put together and it's that collaborative working environment that you can kind of put together within a you know let's uh, maybe we just talk about each of the different areas but previs being a huge part and a massive tool that was a kind of a a dark art for some people, you know, let's make the entire film in bad CG. That's what it kind of looked like to me. But actually now that's where the creativity happens. Like that's when the story gets crafted and finished. Yeah. Brett, would you have, did you do any sort of previs for kind oh. of it or was it kind of just storyboards and? No, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I was uh, using the tools because I thought the more organic and you could, you know, be inside the endemic reality of what you're trying to, first of all, talk about as a theme and a story, and then actually the the tools. But you know what, what this points to is what's most fascinating to me, which is the process flow and functionality that actually there, there's a bit of a uh, kind of a dichotomy that, that happens with traditional film production and how that's happened from, you know, 1935 on 
you know, and there's still in our world, in our, you know, professional filmmaking world, there's a lot of that thought process that's still embedded in that, that, that way of thinking where these new tools and what they allow from the first thought on creatively can actually create an entirely different way that you create a process. Let's take the screenplay as an example. The, the screenplay as a basis for everything, although there are aspects of that that I think that are very, you know, always going to be valid, is actually kind of retro. It's, it's, there, there's something that can be done that really uh, radically revolutionizes the creative process. If you think about it from the standpoint of world building, from the very beginning, building world assets that then lead you to story, which, by the way, is what's going to happen in the context of agency and interactivity for those that are the end participants. So making the process for those of us that are creating this more uh, endemic to what the actual end user process will be is starting to merge. So there's no previs anymore, it's just viz. It's just, yeah. you know, it's creating something organically from that standpoint. And I think, I, I be, my feeling is that a lot of the things that have been going on uh, with uh, some of the Hollywood productions that are using virtual tools are, are just toe dipping that we can go much, much further in the in a new process flow. So that's that's one of the things I'm looking at is how to create a different way of thinking about making a transmedia ecosystem of things. Like, you know, you you pointed to this at, in, in your introduction, Saul, you know, that, that there are many different pieces and parts that are gonna go out there and be expressed and experienced in different modalities. We have to kind of create assets that service all of that from the very beginning. And the final thing I would say is that I believe that can actually be more efficient and more time efficient and cost efficient than the traditional processes being wedged into the use of yeah. the tools. I, I've often said that on Sunday I want to uh, watch James Bond and on Monday I want to be James Bond. Like yeah. it's, the same, it's the same world, it's the same characters, it's the same story. Yeah. Same sometimes, I want, sometimes, I want, <laughs> sometimes I just want to be really passive. Like I want someone who knows what the hell they're doing to tell me a story. And other times I want to go and experience, I want to add, I want to be, you know, participant, but they're not one and the same thing and you need to kind of break them up. But I guess for, for, for virtual, just to follow on from the virtual production tools bit, the, the anecdote I was uh, told about the Lion King stuff is that they wanted to bring traditional filmmakers to set, to location, which was on the Serengeti about Pride Rock. And they wanted to give them all the same tools they would have traditionally have to shoot and create the film because one of the things we were beginning to lack with doing previs and and kind of actual you know building the film you know on a box with you know five or six really decent kind of engineers is that spontaneity and that kind of instinctive stuff that you get with a crew when they're on location to find a shot to build stuff and to see the film organically come together that you just you weren't getting the same spark you get some amazing things because who'd have thought you could send a camera to do some crazy dive but some of the traditional stuff, the textural stuff that those cinematographers and filmmakers have spent the last 30, 40, 50 years creating weren't getting as they were being moved into purely digital. So I think that's kind of cool to that's use right. high-end technology for traditional filmmaking. Yeah, there's, you know, I think there's another aspect to this though that is the, the, the democratization of creation and the empowerment that these tools create is you know, uh, there are so many talented individuals out there that are using these new tools. You don't have to have, you know, a million dollars in a facility to do unbelievable work now. And there, and that the freshness of that work coming from all over uh, the world, you know, is 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 really uh, something that starts to disrupt the traditional effects business, the traditional nature of how visual, you know, high-end visuals are created. And that's something I think that is not looked at very much or it's, it's there. And, you know, it's, right. it's, it's something that uh, these tools, like, you know, just what, what Epic and what Unity are doing is a tremendous, you know, expression of being able to bring whole new levels of artistry and individuals into the process. And that's something that by, by, by doing that, you know, it's taking it out of the sort of, we're the monks on the, on, in the, at the monastery that no calligraphy and no one else does, that is changing. And it's going to change everyone's business model pretty significantly, I believe. Well, I mean, you know, we I guess we'd be remiss if not acknowledging the current state of the world that we're in. Um, yeah. And, yeah. you know, uh, Brett, what's interesting is I think you point out something that could have been, you know, 
disruptive elements to you know traditional infrastructure but now even or traditional uh, businesses and if yeah. you can call some of the, the sort of crazy digital businesses we're in traditional but now we're all disrupted right yeah. um uh, yeah. you know i know from digital domains perspective suddenly pushing you know 800 people out to all working remotely all working virtually um and boo i think you know i, I imagine your team is, is a lot of the same way and we're finding you know we've disrupted ourselves uh or been disrupted um how do you find um you know this this concept of you know in virtual production when we're looking at it is now where it was a interesting idea that we will take under advisement is now uh, we're not necessarily flying to locations we're not able to uh you know put hundreds of people into a shot um you know yeah. we've disrupted We've been disrupted by nature, and here we are. So, what do you, how do you, how is that affecting your business, or how you guys are thinking about content creation? Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's it's taken. It's funny. These you know, any anybody who was in on the technology side, you know, we're talking about it forever. You know, these are the tools, and about distributed teams, and you know, software companies have been doing it for a long time. You know, but in our in production, it's a little more it's a little more radical to do it, and so it's taken a bit of a pandemic to do, to really look at it seriously uh, but you know like our team like within seven days like all of our offices same as you 800 900 people we were all suddenly distributed and my engineering team kicked ass to get us all out like everything from color all the way down you know to finish to to you know our deliver delivery system you know and and also our in, our interactive and creative creative technology team so I think that, you know, and it's also kind of risen to the fore, like what are, you know, what are the tools that are, are working? You know, it's like some, some of us always use Slack. Some of us were always on Trello. Some of us use Jira. All, all of these tools that were just always there uh, mm -hmm. for person people to work in that way. Suddenly now it's, it's had broader, a broader audience are looking at this as well. And I think that in many ways it's brought the teams together um, so quickly uh, and also for us to start problem solving and thinking about what does it look like when when we come back, right? So how do we evolve? How and you know I've always been looking after kind of transformation of the business of whether you're hand keyframing animation to whether we use a game engine and mo various mocap devices, you know, to to um, either do animation capture or even for end, for the end rendering system as well. Um, and I think that you know because we are all spread out, we've had to think about taking these things seriously and branching it out and finding more use cases beyond just the interactive team. You yeah. know, it's going into normal production as well. Well, just from a storytelling standpoint, we are at an inflection point in human culture yeah. that is, it is a virtual inflection point. We are, this is, you know, as a storyteller telling virtual stories now for quite a while in my career, uh, it's this is like crazy. It's like I'm entering one of the cautionary tales that I've made, you know, and it's it's like real around me. And so it's a very strange moment. And I, I think that that creates another paradigm of thinking about what entertainment is at all. It's take, It's creating a new paradigm of what celebrity is. I mean, I don't know if you've been watching how uh, you know, the, the backlash against traditional celebrity tropes are happening, right? I mean, these things, uh, you know, t the word disruption really is an understatement. We, and yeah. so as storytellers, as entertainers, as creators, for me, I think one of the basic tenets is that we must empower what we used to think of as a passive audience to create. And that's going to be the thing that's truly positive around this whole idea of virtual a transmedia ecosystem with virtual uh, aspects at its core, because if it's not that, it's it's scary. You know, there's things that, and you know, that goes back to the, most of the stories I've told about this have been actually cautionary tales. So it's uh, there, there's a lot of irony for me in the whole situation. Yeah, so there, I think you know, just to add on to that real quick, it's like right now at this particular <clears throat> moment in time, we're actually technically speaking, able to have this sort of immediacy and a conversation, yeah. whether in production or otherwise, consider if this had happened, you know, this uh, kind of being uh, kind of separated in this way, you know, 30 years ago, 
what would it mean? Would we be writing cards and letters to each other? Would we be on the phone all the time? We wouldn't, there would be a, a cap to what we could actually do. Oh, yeah. Not just working, but what we can create and how the conversations that we can have. Right now, it's like the way we can produce things and the way we can consume things. It's like, it's it's so, it's we kind of like supercharged it and now like everything's there. And you know, to your point, it is kind of opening it up the audience of, of people who are able to to yeah. uh, create content is there but one thing to that though you know it's like from the from the companies that that uh, are you know kind of uh, work in larger uh, packs let's say um, you know that these new tools basically allow us to work in large packs but as distributed as we are mm. you know because we can whether through you know a, a, a web page or through a headset we can actually see each other's uh, production environments and communicate yeah. with each other in this way it, it 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 is an interesting democratization in a couple of di different directions, as as you're pointing out. Though that the interesting thing is, if you looked at a large company that had a large building, had a lot of infrastructure to support and maintain, all of those things are now being challenged by this, right? Yes. So you know, big company, you know, companies with a lot of folks, you still have people you pay and things like that, but some of the costs could be shifted, some of the agility to do small spin up small projects and spin, you know, individuals to be working on small things uh, to tackle things can happen. Um, so I think it's also an interesting part where companies, uh, big and small, and individuals get to think about that, right? Uh, we're all gravitating towards tool sets. Um, you know, our company, uh, for one, we were working in our own private cloud, but now accelerating towards thinking of broader cloud-based technologies um, you know, the cost points get debated back and forth, um, but it's the tool sets to spin up and spin down quickly that I think we're, you know, finding much more accelerated pace and that need. Um, the concepts that were interesting before are now being discussed as have tos. And to uh, Phil's question um, and anybody else that's got some questions, I'm keeping an eye on the, the chat window over there. Feel free to type them in. Uh, I'll try to get uh, bounce them into the group as well. Um, live action is interesting right now. I think there's the balance of what needs to be live action versus CG. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of, and I'll conflate your two questions. Uh, I know from the Producers Guild side, uh, we've been involved in a, um, a much larger industry sort of task force, if you will, comparing notes. Um, how do we get people back to sets when that point happens? What are the safety protocols? What are those things? Um, that have to come in line. I don't. I wouldn't say anything is, yeah, complete yet. Um, but everybody's starting to think, uh, obviously, about that. Um, yeah. What I think it's it's challenging notions of, uh, you know, backlots in in different continents. Um, uh, I see a lot more productions that are thinking, how do I keep it much more local? Um, that goes into then um, the conversation of the LED walls. Uh, you know, and yeah, you know, the the mythical LED wall will just put a, a digital backdrop and be good um, <laughs> is now really not being just challenged, but explored, figuring yeah. it out. Um, yeah. on well, the that, LED, the LED backdrop is just painting on glass, like it's original it's, matte it's painting. It's, it's, glass <laughs> shot. <laughs> it's just we can move the camera a little bit. I mean, it's really cool. And yeah. for certain shows, it's amazing to be able to knock out so many shots without having to really go that near post-production. And for certain things like for the Mandalorian, that the shiny suit would have been a nightmare, you know. Yeah. And so do it all in camera, fantastic. In fact, probably all of us who do anything near post-production actually like put it in all in camera if you can. That'd be great. Like we don't want to have to clean up your mess. Let us use the budget on the really cool stuff, which you can't do on set. That would be really cool. Just so we're Phil, challenging the notion of fix it and post is what you're saying. Yeah. Um, but, to Phil's uh, point about live action, though, it's um, you know that that there there is real thinking around. I mean, I'm actually working on this thing we're calling safe, uh, secure, alternative filmmaking environment, which we're working with insurance companies and with bonding companies because there's a legal component here. Like I've got projects that want to go, but investors and the bonding, all that has to be thought about so that the liability issues, both between individuals and between entities, have yeah. to be dealt with in a true, so there's going to be some, we're, we're talking about things with uh, creating health covenants 
that are you know based around testing that uh, you know allow there to be a you know a li not liability free but a you know a not a tremendously risky liability environment and then there's the other thing that there are technologies around image acquisition that have been around for a while that you know that reduce the number of people that you need to have on a set even what you think about around a camera you know first assistant second assistance all of these things with actual you know uh, sufficiently so uh, sophisticated technology like so really sophisticated autofocus technologies things that are you know sort of verboten on a professional level to talk about because it's like oh we could we wouldn't do that that's going to become part of the new normal and there's a there's a lot of these parts of the tech stack that have not been utilized because of attitudes that now are being forced to be looking at them as necessities. Yeah, I mean, I think the notion of a closed set is going to take on a whole new meaning. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I've literally heard of productions that the the crew quarantined themselves and yeah, you know, went into effective yeah. lockdown. Um, but I think um, you know, that's if interesting. Like we we actually our close our our close set was more that every every uh, actor client uh, even the camera person they were we were all in separate places we actually did a shoot like i don't know a month ago like i mean a couple weeks right after you know everybody started moving out of the office and we basically set it up where it's just like literally video monitors everywhere and you know to to that point though in some cases it does um make you it has it makes you be more nimble about the ideas that you put forward because you're yeah. not going to have the like you know 50 person party you might have you know a different like uh, the stories that you're telling are going to be a little bit different so to that that to me is really what's truly fascinating about this moment. It's limitation is the mother of invention and the mother of creativity. Right. And and so when you are forced as a filmmaker, when you like, well, I don't got this gear and I've got the, you actually always, if you really are 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 firing in all cylinders, come up with something that's more cinematic, that's better because of those limitations. And and yeah. that that's literally the the, the tenet of directing. It's like you're always having compromises and limitations to deal with. So right. it's when you have everything that actually gets all flabby and, and doesn't really have uh, the creative you know through line to it. And so this moment, I think, changes the creative process in ways that are, it's really exciting. And, and you know, the, to talk to the image acquisition thing, someone was asking about volumetric capture. I mean, there are so many aspects of technology out there that really could be significantly integrated in a whole different way than the way we think of making quote unquote movies that, uh, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater, but it's basically, you know, to really open our heads up and think what is really going to serve character story and emotion, whether it's an agency, whether it's an interactivity, whether it's in linear narrative and how these tools change that and make it actually more, more expansive. And that to me is the, the, core thought process. Yeah, the question you're referring to, Brad, I saw it out there, um, yeah. uh, was asked around volumetric and photogrammetry. Um, yeah. And I would say, you know, photogrammetry has certainly been something that the industry, frankly, a lot of us have been uh, doing long. more yeah. of, uh, whether it was creating virtual backdrops. Um, now we're seeing how that plays into being able to drop that into an LED wall to be the virtual backdrop or to potentially use something as the start of plates for VFX and post. Um, volumetric is interesting because we've seen the rise of that from the 3D capture technology um, and the improvements that they've seen in, in volumetric. So again, some of this is the right tool for a job. Um, the, but if you think about it, it has been that, uh, you know, the mainstay of if, if starting with the scouting, you know, and somebody's going out and capturing imagery and then bringing it back to starting introducing that into the process of building virtual sets uh, building the virtual scouting tools, uh, but now then potentially pushing that into being involved in creating final pixel, uh, you have those content, you have that, that consideration. Uh, with, with, uh, both, with photogrammetry and scanning and how good it is now, the, the idea of going and scouting a set isn't scouting a set, it's capturing yeah. a set and bringing it back. One person go out with this tech, come back, I have the entire location ready to go. If you think of yeah. the quality of the, the real-time engines, it doesn't have to be, and then, drop it onto a LED wall like you were saying. The other thing about it is if you think of some of the tools which you're at, you were talking, Brett, you were talking about like how good tools have got these days. Yeah. And how uh, from beginning of teaching back in 1998, 
creating CG or games was hard, like really hard. And it was real craft and labors of love. Oh, yeah. The tools got easier and easier and easier and faster and faster and faster. And the thing that really comes into it now is about the, the artistry of using the tool. It's not about the technical limitations of it. There obviously are technical things to jump past. The stuff I think I'm, is really interesting with Unreal at the minute is the additional stuff they're ad adding into that engine as usable tools and making yeah. it simpler and more effective to tell stories. So just think of the things recently. So they, they put all the virtual production tools into it for free. So all of the traditional camera technologies, like yeah. scouting stuff, there's a whole set you can just push a button. You can drive an iPad as a virtual camera. You can get in there. They've given away Quixel, which is all that massive photogrammetry set stuff that, that was expensive. You now have yeah. locations at your fingertips for free. Yeah. And they went and bought um, two wow. of the best digital human um, companies in the world with three lateral. Um, and they're going to put that in it. So we'll be able to have characters, places, and sets and locations and get you know 90% down the way if we are and the only thing that's missing is that kind of whether we want to deliver as linear with finished pixels so we'll render it and we'll do some post to it or whether we want to jump into it and be part of it I think that yeah. that we've always known that real-time technologies are enablers but it's always been the um, and to go to your point before it's always been a you're either doing this type of work or you're doing proper filmmaking Right, and they don't want to play with those game engines. That's, yeah. that's for right. games. Now yeah. it's like, oh, this is how we make our movies now. We have to. <laughs> okay, yeah. no, I love games engines. They were brilliant. You know, I can't wait yeah. to make my film. It like everyone yeah. switched overnight. That word, the, that like, word, the biggest fans. Let me throw let me throw in a couple more kind of catchphrases in there. You know, it's like when you when it, just a, a few months ago the. There are there was a whole you know every every proper company right whether they're OEM or whatever <laughs> it's a destination you know um, from concerts to stadiums to malls whatever everybody you know was thinking about digital twins and I don't just mean like here's my virtual character like Grimes made a digital twin and that's amazing I don't know if you've seen her but it's yeah like how prescient is that like I bet every celebrity is just like damn I yeah. wish I had made a physical double of myself like you know, whatever, a few months ago, you know? And uh, because the question of volumetric capture right now is not so easy to go and, and capture somebody right now. Nobody wants to go to a space to do that. Nobody wants them in their house. But, but you know, when you think about digital twins of spaces and, you know, for AR purposes or for IoT or for digital out of home, like all of these things, you know, it becomes more and more, uh, these, these dots and these worlds are kind of colliding and converging. You know, whereas we thought maybe, oh, game engines just for this. Right now, game engines for uh, use of the new phase of digital out of home. You know, how is IoT working? Like that, what is my digital twin of my home so that I do get into that minority report world sooner rather than later? You know, these things are going to be accelerating. Yeah, it's, it's literally that, you know, Cinema, I'm, I'm, you know, cinema is my religion, so I always talk about things in context of cinema. All of it to me is some form of cinema. Being evol it's evolving from that. Cinema is coming to us and becoming our environment as opposed to us going to it. That's right. You know? And and that's that changes the. And there's a whole generational aspect of wanting agency, wanting immersion. That if you're not future proofing your IP for that with the world building process from the very beginning you're not really ready for that IP to be expressed in the way it's going to be necessary for the quote unquote audience, which is actually going to be participants that is there. And that that's why I think the, the, you know, the thinking has to start from first thought on about how we change the nature of the process that we've all been so entrenched in with, because these tools really change it. I mean, uh, that ra I think more radically than, many want to even acknowledge. And I think there's real good reasons business-wise, uh, economically, from a cost and t time efficiency standpoint, where real time and procedural, those two terms become a real you know, bellwether in the, in the nature of how you think about things. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about that in, in just for a second to, you know, to get a little more process oriented, right? I mean, uh, most folks probably out there are very familiar with a traditional, you know, go figure out a story idea, get some funding, you know, develop it, uh, hire the cast and crew, you know, shoot, post, out. 
what are some of the things that we're talking about here? Let's talk about how does that disrupt that process, change that process? Um, you know, where does it, you know, again, if we think about LED walls and we think about some of the work that we do in the post world is now being radically moved forward in the process. Um, can you, you guys talk a bit more about just let's break down for the audience a bit more of the uh, how to rethink that. And it, it ties into somebody was asking about the writing question and the story yeah. creation process. Sorry. So if you want to all give your some perspectives on that, I think it'd be helpful to folks out there. So first. <laughs> er. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I start speaking. Yeah, no, no, no. I think that um, I think that what it does basically is that um, you know, it the iterative process is can be faster, you know, than I think uh, than it would have been through more traditional routes. I think also the visualization of a script can be faster and smarter in a way. You know, like not not to get too far into like the science fiction land, but you know, it's like you could, if you have you know assets already, you don't have to redraw a storyboard every time. You could just be like, you, you would already immediately have your virtual environment or a three D scene that is smart. You know, and then if you change the script to say night, you know, I'm typing in night, and then the three D environment just switches it to nighttime mode. Yeah. You know, or a guy enters enters the doorway, and you know that every time the guy enters the doorway, somebody's going to shoot at him. You know, lots of things that we take for granted in games. You know, I know that when I hit X X Y, this is going to happen, right? And and um, or uh, I know that every time I'm going to duck, I will roll as well before I jump and slash. You know, it's like there are these things that are kind of built into game logic that you just take for granted. But imagine you took that and then use that as visualization tools, immediate feedback on an idea. Yeah, I think game logic is the great term you just brought up because even more than gameplay, but the, 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 the paradigm, the rubric of game logic is what is really you know, transforming the way in which we think. Because if you're thinking as a writer, you know, from the very beginning, it's not that, that that writing process of looking at a blank page is necessarily going to go away, but if you're building world assets and then that's informing how you're interacting with the story that's starting to happen. So it, it kind of inverts the process a bit. And also you can also, because of the nature of being able to uh, distribute a components of a transmedia ecosystem right from the very beginning of creation, there can be feedback from a crowdsourcing standpoint, much faster in the storytelling process. And this starts to get into very uncomfortable areas for those of us that are, you know, think of ourselves as storytellers. We put a story out there and people take it and then we, you know, get the feedback. This is gonna become much more of a vibration than, than a, a, a feedback wave. And that is fascinating as hell from a storytelling, what I call story, I don't think it's storytelling anymore, it's story worlding. And if you have to think in this nature, my friend Alex McDowell, who many of you probably know, who is my, uh, you know, he his, his first film was The Lawnmower Man as a as a production designer. So we've been talking about this for 30 years, and and you know th th that there's a ritual of creation that's going to come out of this that's going to involve what we used to think of as the audience in a whole different way. So you know, again, going back to there's anything that's pre is not really pre anymore. It's literally just part of the creation. And then another way to look at it from the standpoint of just historical perspective, you look at what Tolkien did and whoever else helped him. There's a lot of you know interesting theories on that. He started with making languages. I mean, he started at a base level of world creation in order for that story to flower. And it's one of the most successful stories in the history of, of humankind. So- He wanted a place that, to put his poems. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so you know, it's like it's like we 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 have to start thinking. I think in a more organic ritual of story worlding and creation, because that's the way people are going to be, you know, absorbing this in a much more real time and procedural world of distribution as well. Well, I think it's an interesting thing that um, we used to have to have because of the distribution methods we had to create content for everyone. And over time, we're beginning to be able to make content more niche, more niche. bespoke, more individual. Um, and we can make, we can tell stories which are, some people will love and some people will hate. And that idea that you can create art, I mean, for me, art should be that. You should, 
you should upset as many people as people that love it. Like that's art. If it's just everything, then no, it's pop and pop's okay, but it's not quite as good as when you find passionate people that love your thing or hate your thing. Um, so true. And when you get when you get the ability, so just going back to the very first thing when we were talking about how YouTube is used, anyone can create content and find a fan base to love the thing I love. You know, there is a small group that love certain types of stories in this way, and you can tell them a story. And because of the way of distributing to them and even the monetization side of it. Once you get into being able to self-publish your own experiences and games, you know, on, on Steam and anything else, you can generate a living from telling stories to a small number of people. But on a global scale, that small number of people works out. I think that's a really magical thing. The thing that we often find with indies and small productions is the visual fidelity, the production process is and was lacking. Now with the new tools, the visual fidelity is pretty good. And the tools yeah. are pretty good. And the quality, you know, just look at any of the modern visual effects people who've created entire films and After Effects on a laptop, and you know, and you get excited and frustrated. Is it? Um, but that that enabler, the democratization of storytelling, means that there will be some stories created which are garbage, like because anyone can now tell a story and it looks sick, <laughs> like yeah, great, right. more more spaceships flying around, brilliant, but. Those stories some people love, you know, and that's that's yeah. fine. It's it's just going to be about finding niches and those good quality storytellers that may have been bound by not having the production budget or the production tools to kind of tell their stories are being enabled now to kind of go after and start creating to a fidelity which we all kind of want to experience, which I think yeah. is pretty exciting. It is. It's an amazing time. I mean, it, it, that, that flat that flattening of that curve is is really interesting. I mean, because it's you know, there's a leveling of the playing field, and I've seen stuff done by kids in a basement in Brazil that is blowing my mind. I mean, like like the 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 creative energies outside of the traditional what I call the digital churn of the business really is something I think this this our industry needs. We need that fresh those fresh perspectives and people using these tools that they no longer have to, you know, save up a huge amount of money to be able to get that production value and those tools firing in their own, you know, in their own process. It, it might be a scary thing for a whole bunch of people listening in um, because, you know, we're talking about real time engines and using game engine technology to produce films. And we're used to going to set and locations, but there's a, there's a chap called Matt Workman who's produced a specific tool that runs in Unreal Engine called Cine Tracer, yeah. which yeah. he's created, all of the traditional tools that you would get on set from lighting rigs to sound rigs to camera technologies to lenses and all the terminology and all the actual, you know, you go and choose a cook, whatever, you have it and it looks and feels and acts that way to yeah. give traditional filmmakers the opportunity to transfer into the digital world with the little as friction as possible. And I think it's a really interesting thing that people are doing that. They want to enable people to to move fast and not be held up by the technology. I'll, I'll put the link exactly. into it. But yeah, I mean, but you know, awesome when, when you think about, you know, like animators, right? We've all met character animators. They all have a mirror by their workstation. <laughs> they're making faces and then they're like translating. Because they're really vain. You know, yeah. they're, always touching <laughs> <a blend. laughs> they're like setting keyframes and making blend shapes. And I mean, not, not, they're not, they're setting keyframes. And, and, you know, it's like, and, uh, and now if you can actually set them up with either, you know, like a, a you know, facial capture system, you know, as simple as anything from an iPhone capture or a Dynamics or something like that. It's like you're, there's still the performers, you know, you have a more direct translation instead of the hand eye to that and then back and forth, which is kind of slow and cumbersome. Now you actually have the animators who are just like able to very, very quickly get their performance through. And then they can iterate on top of it. And oh, oh, by the way, uh, the director, the producer, and his whole, you know, the everybody else is actually watching this happen yeah. in real time, you know, and, and uh, being able to collaborate in, in scenes together. You know, yeah. we, we did this, like, you know, we prototyped this, like, uh, you know, whatever, even a couple years ago for a couple of our clients with, you know, using virtual characters. But now it was, now it's not just like that one product or that one thing. Now it can be a tool that yeah. our animators can use, you know, at home, wherever they are. Absolutely. Yeah, how does this shift the economics or where, I mean, you know, in, I, I always caution people, it's like, no, this, all this cool new stuff doesn't necessarily make it cheaper um, right. necessarily, but it, it shifts the economics. It shifts the where you're spending money or what are you spending money on. So do you have any thoughts about, you know, it's again, you know, I don't have to fly a crew to Bucharest uh, to a back lot, uh, but 
Um, you know, so where how, do you have any thoughts on how it shifts the economics or where where the time and the money is spent uh, differently? I think that it's I actually think that it's, you know, technology is supposed to make things more efficient, more cost efficient, more time, not more. And actually, Hollywood writ large has always gone the opposite direction of that because of cultural and custom bound things that I think are in many ways just dumb. Uh, I, I have had to deal with the limitations uh, and it's political. It's, it's, it's about the culture of how decisions are made. It's the cabals and how the, you know, the inside pool of projects happen. I mean, you know, most people don't want, you know, you want to talk about that. I don't care. I'm at the point in my career that I'll talk about it all. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean the executive class, how they make decisions that are very ill-informed based upon fear-based decisioning that is always going to make more money thrown at it, the, 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 the quote unquote solution. I've had to deal with limitations all the time and making things that, you know, had to be more, I had to use new technologies and make them more t cost efficient. So I, it, I was forced into that just by the nature of the projects that I've, I've you know, had come to me through my career. And it's, uh, it, 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 it builds a, a different muscle. And I think that that muscle is going to become absolutely essential for survival for big sectors of our business. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, you know, that's, that may be scary, but I just think that's literally a, a tsunami that's coming at us because there's, there's, a, there's such a leveling as we're talking about of production value being able to be created very cost effectively, actually. It's so as soon as you force it into the quote unquote traditional Hollywood production process, suddenly it costs a lot more money. And I wonder why. I mean, there's a lot of reasons on that. That's a, that's a whole panel in and of itself, of course, one that would have to be, you know, double secret probation probably. But uh, <laughs> we all deal with these things. I know that uh, that that we, we have dealt with these political realities. And I just look at it and go, well, you got to think more like, you know, just in time manufacturing processes, you've got to think more logically about using technology as opposed to, but it's got to fit into this, you know, thing that this is the way we've done things forever. It's not going to be that way because others that aren't doing that, a younger generation are going to come up and eat everyone's process for lunch. That's well, what I think. It's, it's a classic problem that, you know, we used to be able to have businesses stand up and be, a, you know, generational. People could work, work in a job for yep. 40 to 50 years and companies would survive about 40 or 50 years now with a rapid rate of technology not just within our our industry but all industries you are you stand a company up in three you survive for three and you die for three unless you re pivot and reimagine yourself it's a continuous thing and yep. hollywood has held on to cinema pretty well yep. and defended itself pretty well and it, you know the quality of work that is produced these days you know you have to try really hard to make a bad film like you have to really really try because we're really, yeah. really good at it we, we should be able to know what we're doing you know yeah. with the right and you don't even need a massive budget you can create amazing films because we, we, we know that craft very very well um but people are holding on to i built this machine and i don't want to let it go and yeah. it it will change it will all change around us and especially now because of covid and that's a forcing function for all this sort of stuff there will be big the big big changes in our industry and sadly that will also mean job losses and it will be changes you know people have to retrain something else or they'll need to move over i mean it's a it's a classic scary thing but you know the the, the statement that ai will take 25 percent of all our jobs is true but it will yeah. sh create 25 percent new jobs the problem is they're just geolocated somewhere else and they're in a different sector and that's yeah. the hardest thing, you know, the idea yeah. that, you know, you can train an AI on all of the amazing color work you've done. You have all of the before and afters at the mill. You can teach a bit of machine learning to learn how to do a colorist job. Um, and there's going to be a whole bunch of that that's just happening underneath, let alone the idea of how do we put crew on location and what is this mass number of people we need to make the image that lives here. Yeah. yeah. As long as you still have a client whose brain can't be read by the AI, <laughs> well, in the diplomatic path. Yeah, my, my job is secure, and you know, yeah. Well, I, I, it's just an interesting point, Boo. But the, 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 the client should be the audience, right? At some yeah. point, it should be the people that consume it. And there's a real shift that's happening. If you think about any of the big tech startups, they are 
consumer first. They are audience first. They yeah, can they make. Yeah, I mean, really, I, I'll I'll throw a flag on the play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're in in the user maybe, but the people paying for things, right? Yeah. Like the vast majority of people that use Facebook. No, probably all the people that use Facebook aren't paying Facebook a dime. No, it's true. Right? And right. Facebook has to make its money. Uh, we have a good argument whether they have to make the money or not. But right, like yeah. the interesting thing is, is the people that are consuming, and the vast majority of people that are, go to YouTube and things like that, they're consuming and watching, aren't necessarily going. Here's my dollar. Give me more. Um, it's true. So. The interesting thing from business's standpoint and creator standpoint is, is there a way to, you know, to your point, I've often said this, you know, if what's what's great about distribution is the fact that no longer is there a challenge for me to reach an audience. And if I can somehow work out with that audience and it could be five people to give me the value of what I've created for them, we could have a very symbiotic relationship. Mm, yes. It's utopian. I mean, just, sure. I mean, just look at, Look but, at Patreon. Patreon is exactly that. It's yeah, people yeah. donating money for an art or craft or service or anything else and it, it just buying into you. You know, we, we still are a ways. And then I think there is this continual push to that. But we still have to think about, like, you know, as Boo said, the, the client is the, the ad agency or the brand that wants to pay for that piece of material that then gets pushed out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there and there is an interesting shift we can do on Twitch where if I'm a I'm a creator, I'm directly appealing to the audience and the audience is potentially supporting me as a creator. Yeah. Um, mm. So there I think there's we, we just have to be conscious of that shift. You know, if we if you know the people out there in this world, you know, boo, like if I ran up to you and said, I can't go shoot in Bucharest, I want to go, you know, make this movie, I need some backlot stuff. Where am I putting my time and money? You know, I mean, and I think, you know, I think that's a very just right now. Where is that money? Where does that money need to be spent? Right. Where they would have thought throw up a bunch of green screens. We'll make we'll, we'll fix it in post. How's that changed? Yeah. I mean, now it's basically I mean, there you know, people are thinking, well, where can I throw up that green screen? Do I cordon off my my crew for two weeks before we shoot? Or yeah. am I building it as a virtual set? And but bear in mind, even virtual sets have a certain expectation of people there. Yeah, yeah. It's not like you have nobody there for a virtual set. Yeah. So unless you're going full animation or you scale down where you're a guy and you ship him a green screen, you know, and then you put it in there, there's certain things that there there are there are the kind of the good stories where yeah, you can actually do animation ad nauseum right now separately. Yeah. But actually to do a, a shoot whether it's a virtual set or a real set, whatever, there, there are certain limitations about that. You yes. know, to circle back around to something else we were talking about earlier, you know, the question is, you know, with uh, the point of curation, right? Where we've kind of in the last 10 plus years, 20 years probably gone from like, is it, a, 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 do we have a curated experience or a crowdsource experience, right? Do, are we reading the New York Times? Or are we yeah. reading Facebook, you know? But, yeah. and, and, and so that kind of like, you know, uh, curated experience are you actually a filmmaker and you know how to your your you have a honed trained muscle and that's not to say that you have to be in the studio system to do that you no. could be an individual but you know are you still do you have that level of expertise and to the point of if you go to a technology base we can say facebook is de democratic youtube is democratic all that stuff is there however youtube there was a product manager for that you know, there's a product manager for all of these platforms that are supposed to be wide open and crowdsourced for content. But there, if you look at what it is that you're making, whether you're making a film or you're making a technology platform, you know, there there has to be that that visionary, that that owner, that expert in whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, and it may be one person, it may be whatever, but you still have that product owner. Yeah, yeah. it's just the the gates that were there once for that you had to go through, like, you know, it, it, I came in, in in the 80s, you know, late 80s, in the 90s, and, and it, was, it was the end of this sort of way in which it works. Those gates are wide open now in a way that's never been before. And if you look at something we haven't talked about, which is the fact that the entire business model of the industry has shifted to a subscription model 
as as opposed to you know you make a film people that think they know what an audience will want you know in in, in their short hairs they 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 put something out and then that is is proven by box office that's not the model that's going on right now at all it's like you know the and you know bob Iger just before he left you know has changed the nature of the way in which everything is looked at so in a way everyone's paying up front for what their you know, their entertainment is and that does i think start to move into this idea of people you know crowdsourcing for lack of a better term it's it, there's too many you know there's too much stigma to that term but it's in order to actually create something that is going to involve social interaction and social engagement at a much more fundamental and organic level than ever before. And that's mm -hmm. something that the, the current trends that really have turned the entire industry on its head really point to right now. Wouldn't it be lovely if you were a subscriber onto any of these, these, you know, Netflix, Disney or anything yes. else that you could every, every month or every quarter get a questionnaire and you could say, yeah. what Want your money spent. I would like to see another one of those series. I'd like to see a sequel to that. But five five bucks of it is from us. Like I want more of that. That was my show. Not already. Like when you see that they're they're seeing what you they're like, oh yeah, they're watching house stuff. Oh, they're watching horror. They're collecting that from you already. If you think about the service, make it explicit. <laughs> yeah, make it make it. It's it's a secret process now. They don't share what it, it's like. We're going to be the ones that are. We know you better than you know yourself. You. We'll do this for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that 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 is based on how Hollywood has always worked, and that I think is the thing that's going to be changing in a way that's going to radically freak a lot of people out. <laughs> that's that's, yeah, that, that's you're, you're exactly that's, right. I, I, I was going to say the same thing. It, I think it's interesting that they are data mining that the services are data mining the heck out of what people watch yeah. and then trying to make, you know, conclusions of what to go invest in getting more made up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it is fascinating. The service that finally just comes out and says, you know, even if it's not, let's face it, they could do the data mining process, probably get the same exact data as if they put a survey out. But what is the difference in the human condition if I ask you what your opinion is versus inferring your opinion? I may give you the same answer regardless, but what is the value to a consumer out there that says, oh, they ask me and I feel like I had some influence on this next thing that showed up. Now, we, kn we know it may be a panacea, but the interesting thing is, is there is still that moment. Um, I, I hate to say this, uh, we've managed to just plow through this crazy time uh, together. We, we can overrun. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> well, that's where we got to go. Where we got to go. <laughs> don't, as Victor has cautioned us about 12 times, don't touch that button. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I think everybody out there, uh, you know, the, somebody did finally, they said, hey, what's the bridge for writers to work with these creators? I think the fascinating thing is a writer is a creator is, I don't separate writers and creators apart. Um, yeah. And I think the, the world of the hyphenate is the new world order of people that are writers, creators, producers, uh, animators, uh, all of these things blend together, um, especially as the tool sets become Instead of the, uh, I also say that for VR to make it the mainstream, it no longer is special, right? It becomes these tools are no longer in the, in the, you know, corner over there, but they're just, it's like the browser today. The browser isn't, you don't think of it as a technology, it's just a tool that I use. Um, I remember the days I was writing H, you know, HTML code. Um, I think we're seeing that with our game engines, our real-time engines is, they're becoming these tools that are just running underneath uh, yeah. and enabling great creativity. So with that, panelists, I thank you so much. Thank you for taking your time. It's been great, it's been great happy talking birthday, to you. Brett, happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, thank you and, uh, I hope to see you all hopefully physically sooner than later. <laughs> Me too. I'll see you in about 18 months physically. Like uh, yeah, after <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> See you, boo. Bye, Brett. Bye.